that the new generation could give on uh, policy making because we have mechanism that you're all very familiar with, but the digital world is disrupting, including the way we look at policies. And we've been working on this session with uh, Song Nim and uh, gathering very talented individuals and very promising individuals that will showcase uh, not only what they do, but their perspective on some of the things that they've experienced during the two days of the World Policy Conference. But just give me, just, uh, we'll give you a, a quick introduction on how we prepared this session collectively. We believe digital is a disruption, and uh, you can see it notably through the phenomena of platforms, and uh, we will address the question of platforms. It has an influence on how people think, on how people mobilize, on how people make decisions. And here I would like to refer, for instance, to artificial intelligence. We'll not develop it, but clearly this is an impact of this technology. Technology will entail policy by design. One example is, for instance, the blockchain. The blockchain will organize the way people transact without the intervention of third party and will entail element of policies that we will see also at government level. And then the last point that we would like to address is the critical element of the regulator. Today, the regulator works with the current order, with the tools of the current order. And the regulator, in fact, is delaying the adoption of technologies by the economy, is delaying the adoption of technologies by government authorities, and thus harming, not by themselves, but just by the sheer fact of the way they operate today, of the competitiveness of the countries. And this is a very serious question, is how fast can we equip and how much can we trust the regulator that they can exercise their compliance uh, duty uh, with the new tools and in the new technology environment. And this is what we will try to cover with, uh, with the young leaders today. Uh, very shortly. What I've asked them to do is introduce themselves. They are not experts, as most of the panelists we've seen during these last days, but uh, they have achieved quite a few things so far in their young career, and then give one of the one of perspective that they had over the last days. And uh, we will start with uh, Mathilde Pack, uh, economist at the OECD, who will give us uh, an overview, set the umbrella, and then we'll continue with our colleagues. Please, Mathilde, go ahead. Uh, I have a PowerPoint normally. Oh. Okay. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to thank the WPC for inviting me to such a high level event. And second, I would like to thank you all for being here despite the time issue. My name is Mathilde Pack, and I'm an economist at the OECD. I am working in the labor market work stream in the economics department. And today, I am very happy to share with you some insights about how digital transformation is reshaping jobs. Based on a paper I wrote with co-authors on the gig economy platforms. I unfortunately couldn't be here on Friday and attend a session about preparing uh, children and youth for jobs in the 21st century. But I hope I will complement this session by bringing some optimism to the young generation and the more experienced ones about the future of work. Ladies and gentlemen, have you ever dreamed of a world where you would be matched with a perfect employer to do a job that fit perfectly your constraints and would highlight your skills. Well, ever since I started working on the gig economy platforms, I couldn't help thinking that this dream could one day be true. Our gig economy platforms, the new superior business models, a boon? Or will they be a bane for workers that will be just left with scraps? To address this question, I will present you the macroeconomic effects of gig economy platforms based on key features of their business models. And then I will present also their flaws that need to be addressed. 
But first, I would like to give you a quick picture about what gig economy platform exactly cover. So gig economy platforms, they use digital technologies to match workers to customers on a per task basis, the gigs. And there is really a wide range of services and tasks. They can be physical and local, like Uber and Handy, or online and worldwide. They can be routine tasks, or that doesn't require any specific club qualification, like adding keywords on images for Amazon Mechanical Turk, or they can be high-skilled tasks, which requires specific professional diploma, like uh, for consulting or web designing, in the case of Upwork. And so all this wide range of services and tasks for workers to do, for businesses to outsource, for consumers to enjoy. And also note, gig economy platforms, they intermediate labor. So this excludes any kind of digital platforms that intermediate other kinds of services like accommodations or trade goods. Now, I will, go, I will move to present you some, a selection of economic impacts of gig economy platforms on macroeconomic variables. I won't bore you with the technical details. Um, it's early and it's in Sunday morning. But you have to know that we developed a stylized theoretical model and that we tested some of these the conclusions empirically. So there are two key features to the business models that need to be accounted for when we want to assess the potential effects of economic, economic, um, sorry, um, economic effects of gig economy platforms. First, they develop trust building mechanisms like curator, curator of uh, entry or exit to platform, reputation rating systems, customer support and insurance, payment intermediation. And this lower barriers to work because there are some alternative to formal qualifications that should normally stand for um, quality check for the customers. This in turn give more job opportunities to unemployed and people that are weakly attached to the labor market, which in the end would raise total employment. Second, they rapidly match supply of labor to fluctuations of demand. By using digital matching algorithm, self-employed contractors, and search pricing, in the case of Handy and Uber, for instance. This would increase matching efficiency at, employment level, at given employment level, which in turn would raise productivity. But be careful because gig economy platforms, they tend to raise total employment, so this really erodes the productivity gain. So in total, the effect on productivity is a bit ambiguous. So, so far, Gig economy platforms, they seem to be some excitingly innovative thing. Well, I hope I, that's how you feel. Um, but like every innovate, innovation, they are not perfect right away, and they have flaws that need to be addressed. And this is a challenge of, for policymakers, to, that, so that in order to, to uh, really get all the potential gains in a productivity or employment, that the public policies need to be adapted. So for instance, um, the gig economy platforms, they reveal the weaknesses in, um, in um, the market failures in services, which means that the traditional rules may have become obsolete, like for instance, the occupation licensing. And then we have to really to promote level playing field because we don't want to realize that gig economy platforms were successful because basically they just exploit some regulatory or legal loophole and not because of their technological innovation. And so the regulation needs to be applied to all providers on equal footing and uh, social contribution and value added taxes, they need to be harmonized 
across platforms. And then there's uh, regulatory sandboxes, which can be provided to test whether really the innovation part of the platforms uh, explain that success. Then, strong product market competition. This would limit the emergence of dominant players. And this could be helped by promoting uh, mobility of workers across platforms, like for instance, by limiting abusive clauses to prevent switching from one platform to another, or allow the transfer of reputation ratings across platforms, since these reputation ratings will stand for qualifications. And also, the scope and the scale of data collected by the incumbent platforms, they will feed their matching algorithms. And so this could also be like an entry barrier to new entrants because they don't have access to these data and would have maybe less performing uh, matching algorithms. Strong competition product markets would also uh, help preventing the emergence of dominant players in labor markets. But to really improve working conditions of workers, uh, there needs to be some adaptation of labor market regulations, uh, rules on collective bargaining, access to social security, uh, protection, and training. And so now the second challenge for policymakers is to address these flaws rapidly to keep up with the uh, rapid development of the economy platforms. So what will the future look like? I don't know. Perhaps we won't be talking about dream jobs or jobs in the 21st century, but rather about dream tasks, dream gigs, that we would pick uh, through really this big pool of possibilities and through very performing matching algorithms. Or perhaps by outsourcing the tasks we don't want to do or that are routine, by outsourcing them to machines or other platform workers, perhaps we can free our mind and come up with some creative uh, ideas to create some other kind of tasks which don't exist for now and which we can't imagine now, but which will require human intelligence. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. So thank you, Matilda, for setting the scene and uh, giving the perspective. Uh, what I propose to you now, we will go through uh, three examples, uh, through three different types of technologies, uh, be it augmented and virtual reality to start with. Then we will look at uh, the impact of Internet of Things in two different contexts, and then uh, Ermin will give us the view uh, of the regulator. So I call now uh, Marco Janmat that will present his views on, on what he's doing, by the way, as an entrepreneur in augmented and virtual reality, and what he thinks the impact will be. Marco, the floor is yours. Hi, all. Um, I'm Marco Yamat. I'm founder of a company called VRL. And uh, the company basically does two things. One, we build VR and AR applications for companies, and we help to implement them into the organization. And two, we have built an urban planning tool, which uh, allows us to generate uh, 3D maps from geographical data and translate them into virtual reality. So we can show people their future environment. We can show what happens if a windmill is placed into their environment. We can show what happens to the traffic. And um, from what I experience uh, in my personal life, I see that technology has a lot of impact. Uh, on your personal life, especially if you see uh, business models like Airbnb, you see business models like Uber, uh, we see the usage of smartphones that have grown the last past 10 years, and now we can't even live without a smartphone anymore. Um, but if I see the experience from my professional life, I notice that working with governments in urban planning and working with municipalities, um, we are always busy with the current status of technology. So we are always looking at, okay, how should we regulate or handle the current 
fields of technology or how should we regulate it or handle the current playing fields. And the moment we try to talk to them or open up and connect with them on a level to see, hey, what, where are we in five or 10 years? Um, there's always quite a big gap between the technology world on the one hand and the governance world on the other hand. And to give you, I want to just want to give you a small example of that. Um, who of you expects to have a smartphone in 15 years? So if you have a, who of you expects to have a smartphone in 15 years, please raise your hand. Okay, okay I see half of the room. So the other half. What have you ever thought about what is going to replace your smartphone? So, from what we know is that this discussion, okay, how is this replacement of smartphone gonna look like and how is this gonna impact me? Um, I wanna give you a small example. So, uh, I work in the augmented reality industry and augmented reality has the possibility to replace all the digital screens we have now. So, Currently, we have built up a digital system with screens everywhere. You have an iPad at home, you have a computer at home, we have two televisions, we have a projection board. But in the future, with augmented reality, we have the possibility to place this digital information and show it just via a glass. So we don't need all this physical hardware. Because the, the awkward thing is that all this physical hardware it's just when it's not displaying any digital information, it's just standing there. It's just using resources. It's actually a fatal flaw in our digital system. And I have a, a short video that I would like to show you. Um, can we get it up the screen? Okay, I know. <laughs> okay, no video. I'll like, try to explain you. Um, so basically what augmented allows us to do is that we put on the glass and instead of seeing our phone or taking our phone or just looking at a screen, we could literally just say, okay, we open our hands and we could display the digital information in our hands. We could literally say, okay, tonight I want to have my television this big and place it on the wall. But if you're starting to think in these constructs, it also brings a lot of elements to that. So, okay, who owns this digital space? What if you would walk through a street and all this advertising would come into your face? So, this, these questions uh, that on the one hand live inside the technology world, okay, how are we going to shape this world? How is the augmented reality world going to look like on the one hand? And governance, how are we going to regulate this? I think there's a huge, still quite a gap between that. And I hope like in the future and with these type of conferences, we can bring that together. That was. So Marco, thank you. Uh, so Marco is a Dutch entrepreneur, as you will have noticed. Sorry, can we get the video or not about so, so the, the idea was uh, to explain what Marco was uh, saying is that, and I think it's a very important uh, element that we will have to address, uh, the, the, the fact that this virtualization uh, will abstract a complete layer of interaction. So not only now we say the problem is we abstract the layer of conversation between human to human to go to human to machine, and then the layer of machine will be abstracted to uh, augmented and virtual reality, and we will deal with representation, that's what you were saying, of a set of data. We're not knowing exactly, by the way, where they come from, probably uh, another topic. And then, this level of abstraction will create in itself uh, questions about how you govern uh, these elements, because what, how deep and who will understand what's behind? All the users, all the citizens will want to uh, in, engage with technology in this way because it's extremely intuitive. You're immersed into the data and it, it's very easy to understand what's happening in your environment. But then you have these different layers below 
that actually produce what will need to be checked from a compliance perspective and what will need to be governed. And that's the point about augmented and virtual reality. So thank you and sorry for the logistics because I know <laughs> and uh, maybe we can catch up later. Uh, moving on, uh, on, on, the, on another example, uh, I, I'm calling in now uh, Natasha Frank. She's an American entrepreneur. Uh, she's dealing with uh, IoT on uh, re recycling, but um, I'm sure she will not present it this way. So I let her introduce herself, her activity, and her perspective. Good morning. Um, hi, I'm Natasha. I'm, can, is this okay? I'm founder and CEO of a company called Eon, and we work on IoT, which is Internet of Things for the purposes of circular economy and sustainability. And there's a tremendous opportunity here, as well as a huge imperative, because our generation is the first generation to learn of climate change and also have the ability to do anything about it. And the ability to harness the power of technology to enable this sustainable future is absolutely essential. So our company works specifically with a focus in the fashion, apparel, and retail industry. And that may seem, you know, why, why that focus? Fashion is actually one of the most, number two most polluting industry in the world, second only to oil. Um, so there is a massive, massive pollution here in this industry. And it also introduces a, the first model for introducing IoT, or the Internet of Things. And can I get a show of hands of just who in here knows what IoT is? Okay, we're doing pretty good. Um, so the Internet of Things is basically the permeation of the digital world into the physical world, right? So we think of the Internet as something that we search on our computers. Well, this asset, this product, this shirt will be searchable. This will have a digital identity. This will have a profile. And that leads to, you know, the biggest introduction of data into the physical world, which also introduces the biggest opportunity to use data to power a regenerative future. So if we get a little bit tangible with this, what are we actually attaching to a physical product to bring it online? Here's an example. This is what we've developed, um, as well as software that enables this. But this is one of the industry's first RFID tags in the form of a thread that can be embedded into the product, right? So that's actually what you attach to products to bring them into the digital world, right? 80% of retailers are moving toward item level RFID tagging. So now you have a huge opportunity to marry this kind of technology with sustainable future, right? So if this product has a digital identity, now you can access all the transparency, all the information about the utilization of that asset throughout the product life cycle, and you also have the first global system for recycling because you can scan the asset, recognize the material content, sort, separate accordingly. It also is a huge alignment or potential conflict with policy, right? Because now we have products that are identified and we have data merging into the physical world, and how do we even begin to start to regulate that, start to measure that, start to create solutions around that, when most, you know, IoT is very new and emerging technology. While new and emerging, IoT is actually about, by 2025, going to be 11% of the world economy, right? So this is not something that is a sort of side technology. This will reinvent about every single industry as the digital world moves into the physical. Um, so if we, if we actually, you know, compare this, I think an example that helps look at how data, you know, looking at the physical world here is right now when you send mail through the post office, right, the post office doesn't read your mail, right, but if they decided that the post office wanted to make more money by reading your mail, you would say, oh, no, no, right, that wouldn't be okay, yet that's what Google does every day when you're using these services because you're signing up for them for free. Right? And so basically you now have kind of the, this kind of concept that you wouldn't accept in the physical world moving into the digital world. Right? But then on the other hand, if you look at a, you know, an example like that with a different approach, when we look at technology in the physical world, you know, like the use of um, municipal energy systems and the public-private partnerships that go into designing urban energy utilization, there's great alignment there in terms of how the cities and the and the energy companies are working together to create um, urban infrastructure. So here I think we kind of have two different examples of the way that data ownership and collaboration can kind of reshape the future landscape of technology. Um, and how can we now, with IoT, harness the power of that technology 
for sustainability, for you know, policy improvements. And I think it's one of the most important things that policymakers, entrepreneurs, big technology companies get right because this technology is the most powerful enabling technology for a sustainable future. So if we don't look at those intersections of where we can use big data and this, this sort of cross section with consumer privacy and government opportunity, then we won't be able to extract the value here. So I think this conference presents an incredible opportunity to start to look at those new public-private partnerships, how technology plays in that sphere, and how to kind of create solutions that actually support this more meaningful future. So thank you so very much, and um, I look forward to speaking with you all later. Thank you. So, thank you, Natasha. I would like to stress two points. So what Natasha showed you as a, an RFID tag in form of the threat is quite a technological achievement. So. In it, uh, and you will see more. Uh, that, that will accelerate uh, with uh, uh, the, the deployment of notably the 5G telecommunication standard that will allow and we master the problem of the energy on the IoT side, so uh, that will develop. But also for this conference, I think uh, Natasha highlighted a very important point is the traceability and, uh, and the transparency. There will, there will be no place to hide. You will, you will have it. You will know from the beginning where, where it is developed and then produced, manufactured, used, reused, and then uh, uh, recycled. And, and that will provide an enormous amount of data that will not be able to be processed by the normal uh, compliance uh, mechanism that we have today. And we will have to integrate these elements uh, a lot of the IoT data, by the way, will be useless, and to be very clear, uh, because if we, they are just here, but you can't do anything about it. But a very important fraction of it will be extremely useless and will help perform uh, not only the compliance part, but also understanding how efficiency and effectiveness, notably in the consumption, can be, can be improved. Uh, because we will de identify patterns that we cannot identify today by just observing what we see as human beings. So that was the point. So thank you very much for uh, your, your point, Natasha. And now, uh, we, we stay in IoT, but more in the manufacturing space. And uh, I will give the word to uh, Marco, who is a German, uh, sorry, Tariq, who is a uh, German entrepreneur and will present to you what his company is developing and what he believes uh, will have an impact on our life going forward. So, thank you very much. Um, we heard a little bit now about IoT um, and uh, maybe for a consumer perspective. And I want to share some insights for our work life. I'm Tarek from Proglov, and we are a young company from Munich in the manufacturing and logistics industry. And we believe that despite all automation, the worker, the human worker, will still be crucial for the future of the industry. We just have to equip him with the right tools, with the right technological tools, just like. Uh, industrial IoT. Um, so what we do, we, we basically had a look at the industry and uh, how the industry is shaped and what drives innovation in the industrial sector. And we saw that there are two different stakeholders in the end. We have on the one hand uh, decision makers, process owners, plant owners, uh, warehouse owners, who are very interested in how to optimize their processes. They have to deliver a certain parcel at a certain time to a certain customer. And on the other hand, we have people who operate, who create the value by assembling a car, by packing the packages and deliver it. And both ends have one big problem, one big issue in this transforming world. It's efficiency. It's, on the one hand, trying to make things faster in order to save money, or on the other hand, to uh, create a better process quality while not uh, losing time. 
And uh, we had a closer look, especially at manufacturing in the automotive sector, and we saw that all operators have one thing in common. They all wear gloves. And this is where pro gloves come in, because we made those gloves smart. We made those gloves into an industrial IoT feature. Uh, I'd like to present those gloves also to you. You can just slip in. Um, it's a module on top, a small computer, a camera, tracking device, motion sensors, optic, acoustic, and haptic feedback options. And you have even a trigger, a textile trigger at the side of uh, your index finger. When you push this trigger, you actually can see that the engine is released. So people use it nowadays at IKEA, at BMW, at all types of grocery stores to identify objects and to make sure that they assemble the right part at the right time. So by pressing the button, you can actually see a feedback on the back of your hand and you can sense it as well. So it's good for three things. It's uh, increasing speed because I don't have to use a separate tool anymore. Uh, at second, it improves quality because the worker knows exactly at the time he identifies the object, whether it was right or wrong. And at third, it gives us more insights, more traceability on how the processes are designed and how at the real world environment, uh, actually the workforce behaves inside a warehouse or inside the manufacturing side. Um, I'd like to even invite you to, to have uh, an example, not here uh, on stage, but actually at a manufacturing line in Munich of BMW, if the video works. Yes. Would be great. <laughs> So just to give you uh, the perspective about the speed and about um, what drives those people, they actually have to assemble a car every uh, 53 seconds and they have to make sure that they use the right parts and assemble them in the right order in exactly that time. That means every second that they can save is crucial to them. And if you can do it in an even more ergonomic way, it's good for the worker. We heard those needs actually also here in the conference on Friday by Airbus, who mentioned that if in a multinational uh, supply chain, value chain, if truck drivers get controlled at the border and uh, lose two minutes, it's actually real money that uh, Airbus is losing there. So we cannot save this two minutes, but we can provide actually a few seconds to improve the processes over there. With regards to regulation, but there, co uh, there also comes issues in this new technology. Um, we have a technology attached to the worker and all unions, of course, at first say, okay, uh, what are you doing with this data? What about privacy issues? Uh, what about the privacy of uh, my worker? And I actually want to give you an example uh, from an um, inquiry at the earlier stage of our company where a big US manufacturer asked us, what can you track with your glove? I imagine my workforce just like a football team uh, with the players on the field and when they don't perform, I want to exchange them. And this is a boundary for us that's, um, that w we don't want to address. We think that we can address problems in the industry while giving data, anonymized data, to the process owner. But it's up to regulation to define how much traceability um, we can use or how much traceability the company owners can use to optimize the uh, processes. And I think um, what I saw during the last days, it's important to understand for us um, that the pace of technological change is, is high. And we need to keep up in terms of regulation with this pace. 
And um, with this, I'd, I'd like to basically hand over to the regulation part and see how technology can also improve regulation itself. Thank you. So thank you, Tarek, making the link to one of the elements that Matilda introduced at the beginning. You, you showed the type of policies that would be affected here, and it's clearly labor policy. You should know on top uh, now that uh, not only people will wear gloves, but they wear uh, helmets, wear earphones, where they are given instructions by machines that tells what is the next action to be done. So at the end of the day, what, what is the relationship with, uh, between the human and the machine, considering that uh, in the warehouse space, for instance, uh, it's human-less. So today the way the warehouses are managed is uh, without humans. You cannot do it on a manufacturing chain. So this is the evolution, and that's back to the augmentation that technology can bring, but in which conditions. So thank you, Tarek. That was very clear. Now I'm, I'm pleased to uh, conclude the, the, the presentation before we move to Q&A uh, to Hermine. Hermine is uh, from the French Nuclear Safety Authority uh, in charge of nuclear safety and radiation protection in southwest of France and she will give us the view of the regulator in a highly sensitive environment because we've seen uh, more the manufacturing space. Hermine. Thank you Patrick. Yeah, hi everyone. So my name is Hermine Durand. I'm um, uh, the head of the regional office of the Nuclear Safety Authority in France for Southwest France. So uh, the French Nuclear Safety Authority is an organization which is in charge on behalf of the state of uh, regulating nuclear safety and radiation protection uh, in order to protect workers, the environment, patients, and also the public in general uh, from the risks uh, coming from the nuclear uh, use. So, uh, so I come from Southwest France. Uh, I'm a head uh, of a team of inspectors uh, because in Southwest France, um, apart from great vineyards, uh, we have three nuclear power plants, uh, four big medical centers, and also two industrial areas using X-rays. So we are the regulator there. And my point today is, yes, the regulator needs to go digital. Uh, to improve the efficiency of the inspection process. Um, and yes, we are late um, compared to other companies or other organizations, but you know, in the nuclear sector, you can't really afford to move fast and break things. So that's why we uh, decided to gather, like all the Nuclear Safety Authority, at Station F, which is um, a startup campus developed by Xavier Niel a few months ago, and we started to think about how we could go digital. So um, first, let me uh, give you an insight into the life of a nuclear inspector. So basically, uh, a nuclear safety inspector uh, will have to prepare for his inspection. So he will review all the documentation that uh, the operator will send to him. Uh, he will review all the incident reports or previous inspection reports, and he will do that almost manually each time. And then you um, arrive on site, and we can call that an unwelcoming environment because there's heat, noise, radiation, so we need to act very efficiently while we are inspecting nuclear power plants. And then he comes back to the office and he has to write a report and each time he almost starts from scratch, you know, uh, because you have to quote all regulatory texts and see, uh, say what you've seen and what should the operator do. Uh, so it's like, you know, we could um, and we should be more efficient in this inspection process. And I think IT and going digital will strongly help us. And it's all the more important that we go digital uh, as we're going to face huge challenges. Uh, I'm sure you are aware that in France uh, we have 40-year-old reactors and if we want them to operate beyond 40 years, they need to do huge maintenance works and also huge improvements for safety. So um, it was mentioned in one of the sessions that uh, the nuclear cost is rising, but it's um, especially true for new reactors. Uh, in France, we have these old reactors. Uh, we're trying to 
uh, to uh, operate a little bit more than, uh, than 40 years. And for that, we need stronger regulation and a more efficient regulation process. So, uh, having said that, uh, how could we use IT to improve our inspection process? Well, I, I can see three things. Uh, first, we have to optimize information flows. Uh, in some countries, like in Canada, for instance, uh, nuclear safety inspectors have full access to the operator's data. Uh, it is not the case in France, maybe because we are uh, a very uh, transparent uh, agency and we, we have to uh, publish everything we do and we see. So, uh, but it should uh, really help us if we could have direct access to the operator's data. Um, second uh, is that we should ex better exploit all the data we have. Um, as inspectors, we have like 20,000 inspection reports. And well, when we need one, we just look at it in the database and try to see what trends we could use for in our inspection. But we, c we are launching at the moment a big data mining project on these inspection reports uh, to see how we could find some trends and maybe be more efficient and more relevant in our control of uh, French nuclear power plants. Uh, and then third, I think we should uh, develop new tools to save time. Uh, it might seem very simple and basic, but you know, like automatic generation of documents could really help us uh, be more efficient or also like having a dynamic phrasebook for our inspections. So these are a few things that IIT could help uh, us um, with. So what do we need to do that? Well, of course, we need human resources, we need money, uh, but my point is we especially need the security of information systems because we can't afford to do that if then there are uh, unintended consequences. So uh, to conclude, I want to say that um, I don't think digital transformation is going to delete uh, the job of nuclear safety inspectors, uh, but it's going to help us be more efficient. And given the big challenges we have to face, uh, it is very important. Um, but I would also like to say that this is going to be for the benefits of the citizens, because basically if you have better nuclear safety regulation, you have better protection of the public and the environment. And beyond that, I also think that IT will help us improve the acceptance, the social acceptance of the nuclear sector. Um, that's the challenge of open data. So the data can come from the operator, of course. It can also come from uh, the state, so from the Nuclear Safety Authority. And, at, um, and then it can also come from the citizens themselves. Uh, there is an experiment in Japan of a little device uh, that you can connect to your phone and then you can measure the radioactivity of the environment yourself and then contribute to a big platform. And this is a better access to the information for citizens. And I think that could significantly help uh, improve nuclear social acceptance. And it was uh, mentioned uh, many times during uh, the World Policy Conference that this is uh, a necessary condition if we want to uh, uh, pursue the, this nuclear uh, energy use. So uh, the only condition is the security of information systems because, because we can't avoid to move fast and break things again. Thank you very much. So, thank you, Amin. Uh, I think uh, she highlighted a very important point that uh, was not addressed by, uh, because by the predecessors because they, they have to develop uh, their business and grow as fast as possible. But uh, I couldn't uh, stress more what Amin said about security. It goes with it because uh, with our world moving digital, the value of the economy is moving in that space. And then uh, with all possible uh, activities that uh, go with it, notably in terms of uh, cyber criminality, and the security is extremely important. And it's uh, important to protect itself, but it's also important to uh, protect the citizen. And uh, that was a, a very important point. And so it's not only how fast the regulator can adapt, but also how fast you can do it in a safe way. And I think uh, she gave a very strong example. So that is 
for what we wanted to present to you, so the message, I think, should be clear, we have multiple parallel technology development. There is no activity that is untouched, and, but it comes from different angles, so it entails a high level of complexity. But all in all, we are moving from what was a process-centric world, in my view, to a data-centric world, and where data is the thing we should care about, and then we will be able to do uh, a lot of different things with this data in, in, in very different shape and forms uh, versus what we had before where we were all focused on the process and then we processed including the data in the system. It's quite a radical change in the way we operate and now I'm pleased to open the floor to questions. Yes. On. Really interesting stuff. Um, and I guess one of the themes of the conference so far has been that the technological changes of the last decades have tended to concentrate income rather than expand opportunities. And I guess I have a question along those lines for um, pretty much all of the panelists. Starting with Mathilde, Mathilde you gave a very optimistic view of the gig economy. But a less optimistic view would be that it has allowed employers to break cartels, including labor unions and capture most of the technological rents associated with these new technologies. Um, the, the idea being that you replaced organized labor on one hand with monopsonistic employers who, and, and employees who can't organize themselves. Um, clearly that could be redressed by public policy, but it hasn't been, and I'm a cynic, and in my view, whenever you have concentrated corporate interests on one side and consumers and labor on the other, it's always the corporate interests that win. Uh, I guess it, it reminds the point that Natasha was making about IoT and, and, uh, the, the, and recycling raised similar questions because, yes, it could be used to encourage or make recycling easier. It could also be used sim simply to improve inventory control on, for, by firms, which is not a bad thing, but also to evade regulation, to engage in... And firms now engage in transfer pricing. They could use this to engage in actual transfer to evade regulation, taxation, things like that. So I guess my question, which I suppose is also relevant to the regulator, is how can we think of either inherent characteristics of the technologies or public policies that could make sure that these technological innovations benefit society more broadly rather than simply providing, providing more profits, more rents, to the corporations that are the principal users of the technologies. Matilda, go ahead. Uh, thank you very much for your, um, thank you very much for your um, question. And actually, I'm very glad you, you asked it. And I will still be optimistic um, because, well, I didn't give specific example, but uh, so for sure, uh, it's complicated for self-employed contractors to actually be together to, to have a union and then talk to the platform. Um, but then I came up to know about, um, so let's say we have digital problem, but we also have digital solutions. And um, so Amazon Mechanical Turk workers, they actually uh, developed a forum, an online forum, where they will gather um, their, uh, their thoughts about how to improve their working conditions or how to, um, well, how they see the, their jobs, and gathering uh, all these thoughts, voting which, um, which ideas are worth spreading. And I think at some point they are going to send something to, to Jeff Bezos. So, I mean, it's one solution, but still for me there's already some potentials which are also digital in that case. So I still remain optimistic. Okay, yeah, please. Go ahead. Bonjour, uh, Tatsuo Masa from Japan. I have a question to probably Mathilde again. Hearing all these wonderful presentations, this is a very awakening. Thank you for this. One, one thing coming to my mind is uh, technology divide. We used to call it a digital divide, but coming all these digital things deep rooted into technology, there could be a technology divide. For example, if you see sub saharan Africa, quite a few people still don't have electricity at home. So they have no access whatsoever about anything digital or data. 
So those people could be easily left behind all these advancement in the 20th century. And another thing is people who cannot understand all these things about technology, they are also left behind. So there could be risk of widening gap between on the side of technology and who are left behind or even no access. So how do you reconciliate all these risk of divide coming from all these development? Thank you. Natasha, you want to take this one? Yeah. Well, I think it also goes back to the, the previous question I think was interesting. And I think we often ask, how is the current construct going to survive with technology, right? That's sort of the premise of how is policy going to regulate technology? And I think the question almost has to be changed is how is policy and how is the system framework going to change in light of technology, right? Because I actually think big data will reinvent capitalism. Right, and we have new technologies that are like blockchain that are destabilizing the current construct of bank and finance and the peer-to-peer -peer market. So I think there's you know more shift actually that technology will impact policy and how to kind of create that change in tandem rather than just the policy framework surviving with technology. Um, and then I think your your other question around where is you know where does this leave people behind i think that's absolutely true and i think that's a scary thing and i think that's where a lot of policy work does need to collaborate to figure out how we can make technology more open and accessible when you were when you were in the 40s everybody sort of had this one vision of what the youth would be in the future and they knew where their job would be um, and today i think a lot of the terms people just you know either of this generation or younger generations and in different parts of the world don't necessarily feel that they have access to positions in blockchain or positions in IoT. And I think that's definitely an education reframing and, and a skill set um, that maybe can go along with some of the work in the gig economy um, that, that will need to happen. But I think that's somewhere where policy work does, does need to step in to support making this an open ecosystem um, and how to bring more people into this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, please. Good morning, James. Do we uh, follow up on that question for the panel. So if, if we are actually talking about changing the way that we approach policy, what is, what is a suggestion that you might have for governments around the world to take the first step in doing that? Because as we, as we know, governments are risk averse. We must move slowly and carefully and protect our data, as was mentioned, and have valid regulations. But how is it then that, that to keep up with technology in industries like yourselves, how, how would governments take that first step to actually rethink or interact with you to be able to reframe a policy framework going forward? Actually, yeah. I think, um, it's for governments, it's the same thing like, like it has been for the uh, bigger corporations who try to get connection with young entrepreneurs, uh, tech enthusiasts, startups, uh, by creating uh, accelerator programs or initiatives uh, where they work, can work together. Just to get the communication right and uh, to get the conversation starting. I think this is the most crucial part, to start talking together and uh, finding the, the mutual benefits that you can get. I mean, you have something to add? Yeah. Um, yeah, thank you, James, for your question. Um, I think we, well, as I mentioned, of course, uh, government need to invest in uh, this digital transformation and make sure they have all the right resources, like human resources, financial resources. Uh, training, I think training is very important because if you just go digital and no one knows how to use the tools, or uh, it's not going to be more efficient in the end. So uh, I think training will be a very important part of uh, what we're trying to do uh, at the Nuclear Safety Authority. Uh, and my other uh, thought about um, what you said is uh, maybe the government should also um, listen a little bit more to what the public is expecting. And maybe um, the way we open the data should correlate with what people need, uh, what are their questions are. So we're, um, we're trying to do some uh, public um, meetings or debates uh, around the nuclear question. But um, in the end, it's always more uh, it's easier when you are actually answering to the public's questions uh, rather than just 
you know, giving a big speech about how cool you are and uh, what your projects are. So I think, yeah, focusing on what uh, the public is expecting is an important part of the question. I think to add one thing to that too is it's often just technology versus government and actually I think the government needs technology more than anybody. Um, the best man for the job is the one with the best resources, the, the most efficiency to get it done and if the government doesn't adapt to have resources to do those things then they, they won't be sort of the best institution for the job and that is part of what's going to reshape. So I think government needs to think of technology as an asset instead of this, this other. Thank you. Another question? Yes, in the back. Good morning. Um, I find this the discussion we're having very interesting around almost the, the opposition between government and technology. What I do find a bit odd in that and what I'd love to hear your thoughts on is governance in a global point of view from that because effectively governments are not globally governing uh, how technology spreads, how we regulate it, how we protect citizens a lot of the actors are global. Uh, so there's a huge asymmetry there. Uh, I'm thinking data leaks, I'm thinking uh, abuse of information, etc. cetera. Um, how do we actually address that from a point of view that governments can still protect their citizens as well? Because they have a responsibility beyond the technological to protect their citizens, uh, and currently they don't manage. Thank you. So you want to um, yes, thank you for your question. Um, I'm not sure if there's one right answer to it, but I think um, that both sides should have a sense of urgency because if you look at it from a tech perspective, um, we see business models popping up and scaling up global within years and impacting our lives super fast. Um, but now they're also really running into trouble because we didn't talk to the government. They kept it close by them uh, didn't give a lot of insights and now regulators step in and make hard rules. For example, if we look at the shared economy, uh, we had Airbnb spreading across the globe quite fast. And now regulators are stepping in and saying, hey, Airbnb is going to be regulated in the city. And it has a really negative and bad impact on the technology company. Because suddenly they're not allowed to do what they wanted to do. So I think there's for the technology companies, there should be a sense of urgency to early in the development of the technology start the conversation. And I think sometimes the technology companies like us, we feel that we are experts on uh, the technology and that we, because we are experts, kind of think, okay, all others can't follow, so let's leave it. But I think it's important that we, that the technology companies try to explain what they are doing. and really in an early phase already talk to the governance about how this could work out because in the end I think that will also benefit the technology companies. So ju just to add because this question came uh, uh, already a few times I will give you one example uh, on this where we really have to work together it's uh, it's notably in the space of cyber security uh, we it is a, a real issue uh, for uh, because uh, for co the corporate world, uh, we are caught in a kind of uh, asymmetric warfare uh, because uh, one of the most uh, advanced persistent threats come from, uh, from government and uh, corporations are used either as target or channels uh, to uh, get to the, the target. And uh, probably some of you might be aware, uh, Brad Smith, the general counsel of Microsoft, has launched an initiative called the Tech Accord uh, uh, with the objective to create a kind of Geneva Convention around uh, cybersecurity. Because we need to, this is, this is the, the, the Wild West uh, currently. Uh, this costs a fortune to the economy. Uh, this places mistrust in technology, rightly so, because uh, uh, things happen that should not happen. And uh, we have joined this initiative called Tech Accord, and uh, we will support that. that that's really a, a place where uh, the industry, uh, uh, the technology industry, uh, with other 
corporations that are uh, highly digital and, and the government have to come together and, and set up a certain number of rules. So uh, we heard about the climate and I think in cybersecurity in particular, this is an area where we have to act together and develop a policy at global level because we will not be able to manage it otherwise and it is completely undermining the development that you have seen. Now there are other domains uh, where it's less obvious uh, to uh, develop a consensus. Uh, I, I, I give one example. I think we are behind uh, on a debate in ethics, uh, notably when it comes to artificial intelligence. I will give one, one example is uh, when you develop uh, an algorithm, an engine that will crunch a lot of data, you do it with bias. You cannot avoid, you, we all have personal bias, we all have cultural bias, so the way you will address a problem with technology in different parts of the world will not be the same. How do you take this into account, uh, and notably from a government perspective, uh, uh, while you develop your technology? It's very difficult to engage uh, uh, this conversation right now, probably because it is somewhat abstract. While on, on cybersecurity, we can we can we are very active because people feel it on a day-to-day -day basis. So I, I think yes, it's something that a forum like the World Policy Conference also should help develop and say what what would be the agenda, what would be the topics. So I said the, the obvious is cybersecurity. There are other ones where we we don't have yet the understanding about how critical it is while these developments are taking place. So just to complement uh, from uh, the, the panel uh, of our young leaders. Another question, if not, I thank you very much. I hope we could show you uh, the different perspective on, uh, and I can tell you we have a large organization. Uh, vast majority are young people in our organization. They are quite determined, they move extremely fast, they are extremely focused, and they are pro focused on problem solving. So what you just heard will just happen, like it or not, because they, they know they have to face it. So thank you very much.